Adam, well, Yanat Bozovsky is my full name, but obviously that's quite a mouthful, so just Adam JB is fine. I'm a sound designer and composer by trade. I've worked with a bunch of mostly corporate people doing a lot of film and animation, contemporary dance, game, audio. Just a little bit about myself. I got into sound design and composing um, as it was, I was straight out of uni. I did a BA at um, Brighton University doing uh, digital music and sound arts. I'm a producer as well, but the kind of touring lifestyle wasn't really for me. Much preferred to be at home working on music instead. So, you know, you don't have to go on the road all the time if you want to get, be in the music industry. What we're going to cover today um, is obviously the stems from uh, Morley College, looking at how, what production techniques we can use to kind of make it sound a bit fuller, a bit richer, um, for a sound to, uh, sound to picture. And then I'll be looking at uh, a project uh, that I did with Volvo. It was using exclusively string libraries. So it was no, it was no recorded strings. And what we got was a bunch of uh, a score by Joel Cabri. And we had you know, a couple of violin players, viola, piano, and cello. So I'm going to play their version that was recorded as I got it, as is. And then I will play uh, my version. So the first one, and then after a bit of work, this is the second one. Okay, so let's have a look at the first one. As I got them, you know, I've got piano left and right for a stereo, room left and right, which is really important uh, because it gives a full kind of really spatial uh, fullness to, to the track and hear that room sound. It's, it, you know, it's really important to get that. First thing I did is it's important to know what kind of context your piece is going to uh, be applied for. Are you looking for a kind of intimate ensemble sound or are you looking for a big orchestral lush sound these are like important aspects to consider in this respect i was looking for something that sounded big cinematic filmic it's worth noting that the better the recording is from its source uh, the much easier it's going to be in the long run you know you could use the best mic you possibly can but if you're playing not like particularly like it's quite ropey on the day then there's no amount of plugins that you can use to fix that Similarly, like you could be the best guitarist in the world, but if it's not mic'd up properly, you know, you're not using the correct mic, it's not going to be 100% fab in the end. Obviously, the first thing I had to do was pan everything appropriately. So we've got room left and right. So obviously, that has to be far, far left and far right, which gives us 
the nice spatial dimensions that we that we need. These guys playing was, was pretty spot on. The, the only real problem that I had was there's a lot of noise uh, that's being picked up when these guys are playing. A lot of chair noise, everyone moving in their seats. The mics that they're using are really sensitive, so you have to like get rid of all of that stuff. So as you can see at the beginning, I had to do these little fades. And, and throughout, you can see I've, these are automation points of, of volume. I had to duck things massively to, to get these, uh, these chair sounds out. Everything's bust, uh, by that means sent to a, uh, a reverb. This is emulating a kind of large hall sound. Another kind of like cheat that I used is something called um, Dimension Expander. This is a free plugin, kind of gives this really nice width to everything. I mean, it's very subtle, it's very subtle, but to me, it just kind of adds this, you know, this kind of doubling effect. In terms of EQ, I mean, you know, like I said, these guys were pretty on point, so it was just a matter of, of balancing everything. It's also um, worth noting the kind of uh, placement in terms of where our strings meant to be sat in terms of, like, the, you know, the spatial um, field. If we look at uh, kind of Hollywood strings, it's kind of a standard setup. If you're facing them, you know, the, the cello's on the right with the double bass. And the violins are over here and the, and the violas are at the front. It helps with your, with your stereo field to know the placements of where things should be. So as you can see, I've moved things to the left uh, for the violins and the, obviously the room is normal. So these, these have been uh, rejuvenated, as it were, with a, with a bit more strings, just to kind of give a bit more width to everything. There was actually originally a double bass part that was meant to happen. It wasn't recorded on the day. I was given the score and I just kind of played it in myself, which adds this really necessary low end to the entire piece, which kind of gives it this gravity, which is, I think, really you know, evocative in terms of the piece because it's, it's an incredibly violent piece uh, scene that we just watched. So, you know, if I just solo this. So it makes a real difference to everything and it kind of gives it this in enormous, you know, it's like adding, you know, a sub to everything. And then I doubled it with a, with a cello. It's just kind of gave it that more, that much like richer sound. So, I'll, you know, without the cello, it sounds. And then with the cello. So without the things I added. Still, still a really lush piece, but it just kind of gives it, like, it kind of tricks you into thinking that we had like a full orchestra going on there. Another real fair point to make is actually uh, labeling, really important. You don't know like when you're going to be looking at stems again or who's going to take these things on later. The art of good labeling is something you should always be aware of. So, you know, so these, these say like room L and room, room R. So I know immediately, as someone who didn't work as an engineer on the project, immediately what's going to be going on. And then I know if I send these on to everyone, they know exactly what's going to be happening, where everything should be. So one of the violins had a, a touch of kind of dissonance about it. When you're obviously the violins got quite a wide range, so it's kind of it's quite harsh on the ears. So I just rolled up a little bit of the EQ, but if you listen to it here. <laughs> see round about there, quite sharp. I think if I take the EQ off. Go. You know, really, really, really bites through and really cuts in the higher frequencies. Very delicate instrument, uh, the violin. It's got, got incredibly high range. So you've got to really be careful and like, roll back those frequencies. And then obviously at the end, there's this tremolo section. And again, so I just added um, a cello and a double bass tremolo. In the context of uh, against everything, it sounds great. You know, it kind of sounds like someone with wool over some paper, but then when you when you play it against everything. So yeah, that's I mean that's working with normal strings. I, I would say 
it's not it's, in an ideal situation. It'd be great to always have a, an orchestral uh, ensemble at hand that you can just record at any time. Not going to happen, really, in realistic terms. So, working with real strings and combining uh, libraries is, you know, the, the, the optimum um, that you can really get without obviously being Hans Zimmer um, and just having an orchestra whenever you want them. If you have a friend or you can hire someone and you've got a string part, get them to play on top of it. You know, you can lay down some lush strings, you know, whatever you have, and get a lead part in there. It's, you're, you're never going to beat the sound of a real string player. Um, no matter what your recording set up, it's always going to sound better. Um, and that kind of leads me on to uh, working with string libraries. So briefly describe you know, the, the brief that I was given. It, it was um, a project for Volvo, and they were releasing this weird spray paint that makes you glow in the dark um, called Life Paint uh, for cyclists. And the reference I was originally given uh, was a glitch mob track. It's a combination of electronic uh, elements and uh, acoustic elements which kind of trick your brain into thinking that it's real strings uh, because you, you've got this uh, electronic counterpart. Um, so I'm just going to play that for you. So getting into that, the string part starts with these kind of staccato strings, they're kind of filtered up. And the kind of the melody, as you can see in, in this piano roll here, develops as the piece moves on, which kind of builds tension, it kind of you know feels like something's about to happen. And we you know we, we're ending on a on a high uh, high note at the end. These are all done on cellos, by the, by the way. Kind of really, I really love the sound of a cello, so it's really rich and really deep. And, you know, again, it's important to know what, what's, what's our intention here. What, what are we trying to uh, achieve? Are we going for a big orchestral sound? Are we going for something that's more intimate? Which kind of brings me on to an important uh, element, which is uh, the vocabulary and the range of, of strings. It's important to know these terms, when I say things like staccato and legato and, and pizzicato, they're all these Italian words. The string instrument has such a wide breadth of um, tonal and timbral, uh, you know, capabilities that 
there's so much you can get get out of it. It's important to, to know what these things mean because when you look at a string library, as we'll look at, um, they have all of these terms and you don't really know, might not know what they mean. And if you've got something in your head, you know, how, how is that going to play out? You need to know how to adapt that from what you see on the screen, you know. So if you want something that's really slow and lush, or if you want something that's stabbing and and harsh like this, you know, you're not going to choose um, legato for this kind of playing style. Another important thing is is uh, string string instruments have different ranges. You can't just play all the way to you know minus C1 to C5 on on a on a cello. They've got a limited range. You know, this is kind of um, just a, a visual cue of what's available. So, you know, obviously you can see a violin has a much higher range um, than, say, a cello. So you're not, you're not going to play really high parts on a cello. And similarly, you're going to transpose any bass aspects that you might want to arrange to a cello and to a double bass. So they're playing all of those parts and um, the violin are playing the high parts, which is important for arrangement. Later in the piece, we kind of move to this big legato sound, which and by, by that I mean the strings are playing long, um, drawn out notes. <laughs> now, as you can see here, I've got um, three different cellos playing that. One's playing a low part, and one's playing both are playing high parts. The thing I really like, the, 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 uh, the string things that I'm using is, is, is a plugin in Contact called um, LA Scoring Strings, which is uh, by Audio Bros. In, con uh, in the LA Scoring Strings, you can see here, we'll zoom out a bit, what I get is basses, cellos, an ensemble, violins, violas, and I go into that and it's, it's got another subcategory of A, B, and C, which are all different recordings, um, and the amount of players. So you have first chair, which is really good for solos, um, cellos. And so what I did here, oh, let's cancel that. out, is that you, you click into that again. So I went into uh, three players, cello A. And like I was saying before with the articulation, you've got all these different uh, Mode. So this L is for legato, L fast, medium, um, pizzicato, sordino, staccato, tremolo, all of these things, that they have different articulations in them. So with that, internally, I took uh, the staccato from A, um, I took the staccato from B and C, and then laid them all inside contact. Um, they, they automatically jump to different uh, MIDI port, so I had to set them to MIDI port one, and so they're all just inside there. So rather than having to make three contacts, which would like probably like blow up my computer, I can do it all internally uh, in this little guy, and so they sound. Uh, like that. And then you can mute them all off. These packs are not cheap, but they're really worth investing in um, because they sound amazing. They, these things have a, a kind of sweet spot regarding their range. When you go too high, it kind of sounds a bit digital. When you go too low, similarly so. The thing I really like about um, these particular strings is the articulation in the legato. It's velocity sensitive, so if you're playing uh, really lightly, you can hear this kind of portamento glide, you know, like if you see on a synthesizer, it says glide sometimes. The, the way it moves between the notes. It's not going to do it there. Um, let's try this one. Hear it seesawing like that, which I really love. It sounds really authentic, sounds really expressive, and that's what you want. When you get cheaper strings, you don't kind of get that breadth of uh, articulation. Another uh, important aspect of, of string libraries is in uh, reality, when I'm working on a pitch, my pitch will come in uh, about 
12 hours before the client needs it. There is like an enormously fast turnaround uh, in these kind of things. People expect you to work miracles and you don't really have the time, the feasibility to go and find a string orchestra and quickly record them for your pitch and then send it to the client and hope that everything's okay because inevitably they're gonna ask for a thousand different changes. These string libraries uh, are really, they're, they're very reliable uh, and they're there. And when you want changes, you can just dial it in really quickly and you don't have to worry about re-recording uh, you know, another, another string part because that's not gonna happen. But like I said before, uh, it's ideal that you could, you know, if you, if you have the potential to record live strings with that, it's always gonna sound 100% better. Another aspect about these string libraries is that they're very CPU intensive. They really eat up a lot of RAM. In this bit, I've stacked three on top of each other. Um, see if I can, which kind of, they're all different. It's A, B, and C. So you can kind of hear, these ones are a bit further back sounding. These ones are quite close. These ones are quite different. So. But combined, they give a really nice, like, widescreen cinematic sound. Um, again, I've bust everything out. And the reason I do that is because I don't want uh, to lose the, you know, the articulation and, and, and the feel of these strings. I want them to sound um, so you can still hear, you know, the sound of that bow coming across the string. It's really important. If you drown that straight away with reverb, then you're going to lose all of that. Obviously, sometimes you kind of want that effect, but it's uh, for this purposes, if you hear it dry, they still sound great, but with a nice bit of reverb. So when you're bussing something, um, sometimes called a send, what you're basically doing is, is you're creating another uh, audio track to send channels through. So I could, uh, down here, they, they, it's called A and B. You can have a lot in, in, um, in Ableton. And, and you know, with Logic, they're all the same. So if I, if I turn this reverb off, if we just assume that nothing's being sent to it, that's, that, yeah, that's how much is being sent. So I can add a little, I can add a lot. Um. You can hear when I'm pushing it up, it's, it's pushing it to another, it's uh, sending it to another track, which is making it louder. The benefit of this is that you can have, say you've got one effect that you really like. You can have multiple tracks being sent to it at the same time, so I don't have to keep using the same reverb every time on the on on another track. I can send all of my string parts to one reverb, and then they're all coming out, and it's not a really CPU low intensive, um, and it means, like I said before, you don't lose the articulation. I could have the reverb on uh, the the uh, the main track and kind of take the dry wet level off. So you know, I'll take that and show you. So I'm putting the reverb on, I'm turning, this, it's the exact same reverb, but I'm gonna take it, the dry wet down. It's still good, it's still good, but, it's, but if I have to do that for every single track, then I'm eating up so much CPU, which I think leads me to the end of my talk. <laughs> <laughs>